It's a holiday week, and the markets are giving you a gift to take home to your families. You can get them to buy crypto at the highs again this year. Cannot wait for that. We'll be discussing the latest that is pumping the markets, what we have our eyes on in a shortened holiday week, and much more today on Money Never Sleeps. Welcome back, everybody. Hope you had a great weekend. As we get going today, do us a favor. Hit that like button down below. Subscribe to our channel. Nothing Kevin or I say is financial advice. You know that at this point. So please do your own research for making any buys or sells. Kevin, we have a green, green, green market today. Tis the season. My beloved NVIDIA is up over $500 a share. 504 for a new all-time high. Let's hear it. Jensen, you beautiful bastard. You've done it again. What a day to be alive. We see crypto had a nice little bounce back up. Apparently, Argentina is going to come save all of our bags. Meanwhile, Sam Altman and Microsoft, I don't know what's going on in there. The robots are getting ready to take over. Can you please steer me in the right direction, my guy? Yeah, man, it's the rise of the machines, honestly, between the, the computer machines that are on the trading desks of the biggest firms or the open AI absolute chaos that we've seen over the weekend. It's been an absolutely wild weekend. Like there's been so much news and developments or all that stuff. And then we get a ton of news this morning. Um, markets don't seem to care because Thanksgiving is this week. And I honestly don't think that markets are going to go down this week based off of all the sentiment out there right now. Uh, maybe we can look to the future in a little bit, but yeah. Do you want to start with some of the open AI stuff? Cause that's really interesting to me. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it was Friday right after, right before markets closed, they announced that the, the board was getting rid of, uh, Sam Altman and the one guy, I think his name was Brockman. Um, but they pretty much got rid of them and it caused a huge uproar amongst the entire, you know, company. We saw that Microsoft tried getting in, in the way, and I, I can't pronounce the CEO of uh, Microsoft's, I think, Satella or something like that, or okay. Nadella. I think that's what it is. He was Nutella. working. I've been calling him Nutella, man, but I don't, I don't want people getting pissed off at me for calling the dude Nutella. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Nutella was going after uh, you know Sam Altman, just trying to broker a deal to the point where it's like, okay, maybe Sam and, you know, I think... I forget the guy's name. It doesn't matter. It's all about Sam here. But they were so concerned about getting him back on the board or back in uh, open AI because obviously that's his that's his child, right? And he's the one that's been steering that since the beginning. And you know, just losing a CEO like that out of nowhere is pretty, pretty abrasive. And I think the fact that it happened on Friday, right around the time markets were about to close and then coming to Monday, they didn't want anything bad to happen, especially ahead of NVIDIA's earnings, because we do know that AI. This, especially ChatGPT and OpenAI, is so invested from all these other companies. I mean, NVIDIA to Microsoft. There's a reason why they definitely wanted to take care and make sure this is all, you know, settled by Market Open. But the problem is, we still don't know exactly why he was let go in the first place, right? The board was going to, you know, resign and let him come back. They chose not to. Uh, they hired the ex CEO of Twitch. And now we're starting to see a lot of people from OpenAI that are willing to quit because of what's happened unless uh, Sam gets reinstated, but looks like Sam's staying with Microsoft. The entire team might move over to Microsoft. And the problem I find with all this is that 700 of the 770 employees there are going to leave. That's a, uh, it's a problem. It's a lot of money in open AI that people don't realize. And the problem I think that's, that's probably going to cause Microsoft the most issues is when it comes to all these people now working for Microsoft, is this a conflict of interest where, okay, now all these people that have been working on this intellectual property are now carrying it over to Microsoft in some way? Is, uh, you know, is the board going to end up, you know, having a case for a suit if this happens to play out this way? So I don't necessarily think this is super bullish for Microsoft. I think maybe long term it could be. But for the time being, I think that there's a lot of bad blood between these two companies. And I don't think Microsoft, uh, Nutella coming in and saving, you know, picking Sam and then all of OpenAI's uh, staff coming in to, you know, rush to his defense doesn't paint a good picture for OpenAI, ChatGPT, that entire product itself. Yeah, there's going to be, there's probably government intervention at some point. 
just around monopolies and you know intellectual property like you discussed there'll be lawsuits it's going to be it's going to be a whole nightmare uh All about so, the nerds man dude. nerds are getting ftx if it wouldn't be november without some you know some sand going down at some point i mean that's just what we've come to uh to know and love at this point in time we have a pretty slow week ahead as far as earnings go as well as you know government reports we get fomc minutes tomorrow that'll probably be the most impactful thing this week we get some services and manufacturing data on friday some jobless claims durable goods orders consumer sentiment on wednesday but nothing too earth shattering next week is when you know after the holiday when things will start to get real so looking forward to that on the earnings front we do have nvidia tomorrow it is pumping ahead of earnings i'm you know, I don't, I don't know what to expect with the earnings tomorrow, but we also have, you know, some other companies, Lowe's reporting earnings, kind of just scrolling through it now, HP. Autodesk, uh, that's a big one you should keep an eye on. Autodesk, okay. Um, I don't know much about Autodesk. Why don't you fill me in there real quick? Yeah, so I actually used to use Autodesk all the time. They have pretty much software that goes for different industries, but I used to use it for, you know, visual effects and computer graphics and stuff like that. That's huge in, you know, the film industry. So it's really interesting to see how that's playing out with, you know, a lot of the strikes that have happened over the summer. Obviously, these are the earnings from the previous quarter. So the strike recently just ended. So I'm interested to see if that has any effect on it. But the most important thing I think that they offer is software that comes to manufacturing and we know that there's a huge contraction of manufacturing globally right we know that you know italy germany um, we're starting to see contractions in other parts of the world too in asia so i'm really interested to see if this has any impact on the software itself it's also putting in a really weird pattern i'll show you yeah, we'll just show it up real quick uh you know it's it's putting in this triangle and it's a symmetrical triangle or it's kind of just trading back and forth within this range it broke out of it and it broke back into it but we're getting overbought on a lot of these time frames right weekly is going to probably be over here i think that's why we're gonna have a fine week this week but fairly soon i do think that we're due for a correction and if i did the counts right this is five waves up and this is be through three waves down so that's one thing i'm looking for i think it's just something that's putting in a pretty clear pattern for autodesk and again i'm very bearish on manufacturing right now i think that's going to be the tell for a lot of what's happening to the economy and also the strength of the consumer and also the producer but uh you know eventually i do think that this could break and we could be looking at something pretty deep roughly you know similar to tesla around 64 is you know one range i'm looking at but i think it's something that not a lot of people are talking about uh, i also think the other big one obviously is nvidia right that's the one that i think everyone's been keeping an eye on we talked about it a while ago and i said nvidia's and apple were two of the stocks that could bring the market down um <laughs> let's see what happens tomorrow i'm not necessarily sure what's going to happen with it i mean if it reports earnings and you know they beat expectations and they're doing extremely well well does it keep pumping from here or should we were bought did we price in a lot of this move already when we were down by 400 dollars and now we're at 504 that's that's some of the questions that i'm really asking myself going into tomorrow because i don't know we've been extremely extremely forward looking in this market these past few weeks and i'm not necessarily sure if that's going to eventually come to an end or if we're just you know fooling everyone thinking that you know tech stocks are going to be fine while the consumer begins to show massive cracks and especially uh some of these smaller businesses do as well okay yeah that's gonna be an interesting one let's talk about argentina real quick i want to pull up if you want uh YPF. YPF. <laughs> this was a stock that we talked about back over the summer oh look at that we dude. at uh you know companies in down in uh in south america that we we are interested in and this one came across my radar i think it was around like eleven dollars a share it had a nice run up it came back down and then with the election yesterday I mean, the election results, look at that gap up. Good mother of God. It's, uh, I mean, the, this is the thing. The first thing I noticed when I looked at this, obviously, the green candle, but another death cross rally, guys. As soon as we get that death cross, the market just absolutely pumps. Maybe it was timed up perfectly with the, uh, with the election, which most likely the case. We also saw a small little pump on crypto, but that's a 41.29% day right there. Uh, it was a little bit higher, too. It was a 15.39 earlier. But, um, yeah, I mean what can you say that's a big gap that is left behind right and if we're 
you know, focus on filling gaps. Eventually that will have to get filled at some point. I do think it's really funny how we get these news events. Like obviously this election seems kind of bullish uh, for the U S going forward. Eventually he, I mean, it, it is bullish long-term, but again, Argentina is not going to save the entire, uh, you know, the world and from any of what's already been going on. Um, you know, I think Argentina is definitely going to have a bright future ahead of them. Am I sold on Javier Malay? No, not, not at all. I, I don't believe in any politician, but I'm interested to see what he's able to do to bring, uh, you know, Argentina hopefully out of absolute inflationary, uh, what, couple decades that they've had there. Absolutely insane since their early 2000s. Thing is, too, it's um, a lot of people I've been talking about, but everyone's saying how pro Bitcoin he is. Kind of was telling us that he was going to get rid of the Argentinian pe peso and then replace it with the USD and put us on the, the dollar, uh, put the Argentina on the dollar, US dollar. So I don't know why the US dollar is not pumping, but YPF sure as hell is. Yeah, a lot of those, uh, a lot of South American ETFs and stocks are having very good days. Let's get into the crypto side of things. We, you know, we've seen this, you know, these these legs up lately. And you know, I'm looking at like the the shorter time frame, like the daily charts for a lot of them. And we've been going through this same pattern. On the question now becomes, can this pattern continue? Or are we hitting a point of exhaustion as we near the end of the year? Yeah, um, I think you're right in both counts. I think it's both are equally as true, right? Um, I think there is a little bit of gas still in the tank for some of this crypto move. Um, clearly, we saw some today when we looked at the BNB charts, right? Out of nowhere, it was up like $15 or something like that based off the news. But um, yeah, that's also, I mean, it's also a sign of an illiquid market when you see moves like that. So let me just uh, pull up Bitcoin real quick and we'll take a look at that because and then we'll take a look at BNB after. But um, Bitcoin's at 37.5 today and it's had a pretty good day um, given what happens with uh, CZ and Binance and some of those charges or settlement offers that we saw. But let's pull up this on the hourly. You can see where it was extremely volatile back here. You had a pretty good move up. And you're seeing these massive wicks to the downside, liquidating people in both directions. We're only up about $138 right now on the day, but we're still within this supply range. And if we want to say, hey, uh, maybe this is a triple top here that we're going to try and form around 38000 maybe that is, right? I think that there is still a little bit more room to the upside, especially if we look at the daily. I think that the daily is plenty of room to go up. We haven't moved up despite actually moving up in price for the past few days, which is really, you know... A sign that there's probably a bit of a uh, bit of uh, buying pressure that's leading into it. Again, I don't necessarily see any bearish divergence. A little bit right here, but again, that's only a few days. I think that there's a good chance that we could push up just a little bit higher. Um, maybe by, before the end of the year, we get to like forty thousand. Could happen as early as next week. In the next few weeks, I think it's going to be really interesting to see what Bitcoin does here. Actually, but um, I think that's this move is pretty pretty unsustainable if we look at this in the grand scheme of things again we talked about how the volumes are extremely low compared to march we are seeing the price push up but again i think a lot of this has to go back to how the exchanges are doing a lot of what's happening with these stable coins and it kind of breaks down to what happened today too with uh the four billion dollar settlement that came out from uh, the u.s saying that doj was willing to settle for that amount uh with Binance and CZ for any of the criminal charges. So I'm going to pull up that article real quick because I think it's really interesting to see what's going on. A lot of people were very excited when they saw this because it's like, oh, $4 billion. They got that. They could pay for that. You know, then they don't have to worry about fighting the U.S. anymore. They're not going to be uh, there's not going to be as much oversight. Well, let's let's think about that for a second. So here's the from Coindesk. We don't use Coin Telegraph anymore because the interns are liars. Uh, Bitcoin and BNB token stage relief rallies on Binance settlement news. Right. So it was a four billion dollar settlement to mul for multiple criminal charges in the U.S. I think it's kind of funny that they put four billion because you know I think a lot of people were expecting like five hundred to one billion dollars, but four billion just seems kind of like we know you don't have that money, so let's just fuck with you and put four because that's all you've been throwing up for the past year and a half. Now. Do they have this money? Possibly. They possibly have this money. But the problem is a lot of their reserves are in Tether, right? We know that a lot of their reserves are also in BNB. But you can't get, you know, the U.S. isn't going to take Tether. They're not going to take USDC. They're not going to take it. They want fiat. That's the problem here. So if they don't have the money, then this is pretty much just letting us know that, hey, something that we didn't know before was that there weren't criminal charges from the DOJ that were against Binance and CZ. We know that there is possibly an investigation going on. They wanted to open up an investigation on them. But now we know that there are charges. 
and that's a dangerous thing because I think a lot of people who rallied and got excited and buying, you know, BNB thinking that, oh yeah, they have the money. Well, that money's gonna have to come from somewhere. And I honestly think that if it doesn't come from BNB or Bitcoin or them pushing the market up, then they don't have the money. And they were saying that maybe as early as the end of this month, they could settle. Well, I don't know. This guy also said that he wasn't willing to, uh, you know, he, he wanted to get the SEC case dismissed for Binance US, right? He he submitted, I think, like 20 pages for, I can't remember exactly what it was, 20 pages when you're supposed to probably submit a ton of information so that way they don't know what, exactly what they're looking for. He seems very careless in a lot of the way that the US is carrying out some of the legal actions against it. So I don't necessarily know if he's going to have the money to do it. I think that Tether also is in a bit of a tricky situation here because if he does need to redeem a lot of that USDT, maybe they're not as open to, you know, allowing him to, you know, send that USDT to the exchange, sending him the cash and then burning all that Tether. I don't think that they actually have the reserves or have $4 billion of liquid cash on them at this moment. Uh, maybe they make some room there, but I think that's this is something that's probably more negative than people are anticipating. I'm staying bearish on Binance for this reason. Uh, again, I think it's just the DOJ, the fact that they have criminal charges that we didn't know about before. That's probably the big kicker, I think, here. And if we look at the price for BNB, you can see that they had a really good liquidation up there earlier today. Um, I probably would have been liquidated if I was still in BNB, to be honest with you. But let's go here and kind of dismiss all this technical analysis. We know Boy. that they... They did a lot of bad stuff back here. Like, look, we can just delete all this. This doesn't even matter anymore, guys. These guys, when USDT is in the picture, it doesn't matter. But yeah, look at that that candle. I mean, it was up, you know, all the way up to 268, I think. Yeah, 268.5, uh, you know, from bottom to top. That was roughly 12.35% push to the upside. It's 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 hilarious, man. Um, I, I mean, I what can I say? I think people got excited saying, oh, yeah, they'll be able to get out of this. Do you know that for sure? I don't think people realize that. And, oh, dude, I was on spaces today. I was on so many dumb spaces today about people talking about this. And they were saying some of the dumb things like, is CZ an informant for the U.S. government against Tether? I'm like, shut the f It's some of the stupidest, like, theories. And, it's again, people are just not paying attention. And it's, that's the thing that – dude, I, I honestly think that there is – such a massive bubble. And I was telling you before the show, I think that there's a lot of people that just don't understand the industry that they're investing in. And that is absolutely a bubble. They're buying because they anticipate someone else to buy. That's a Ponzi, bro. I mean, it, it's not sustainable by any means. And I think that's what we're getting here in crypto. A lot of people are buying. I don't think a lot of people are buying. I think some people that really are bullish on crypto are buying, thinking that, you know, we're going back to all-time highs. If I look at this fucking chart right here, I mean, not even close to this high back in April of 2023. It's a good move up. Don't get me wrong. But you got resistance right here, resistance right here. Um, unless they start printing more USDT and making BNB even more worthless, I don't necessarily see a way where this is a bull market for BNB and people are getting excited i think this was 100 a liquidation event it's buy the rumor sell the news they haven't agreed to the settlement i, I saw some reports even saying that they agreed to it it's like what i don't think bnb cc is going to agree to this at all but uh that remains remains to be seen but i think it's very bad news for crypto in, in general i think it's bad for tether it's not explicitly said but i think it is and uh, eventually i think that this is going to break at some point we do know that there's not a lot of usd or fiat liquidity out there i, I mean the proof of it is just how little uh transactional volume we're seeing on coinbase and Robinhood, right that just shows you that retail is not in this move really a lot of this is institutional and by institutional i mean exchange driven all right let's uh let's go ahead and look at some of the big boys here why don't you pull up uh where do you want to go with this? Do you want to go TradFi? Do you want to stick with crypto? Let's do TradFi because this is a uh, this has been a hell of a move to the upside. I won't I won't uh, knock it down, but I want to pull up this chart on the S and P. We can see that the S and P is extremely overbought on the daily. Right, it's been overbought since November second, roughly. Uh, November third. We'll say November third. So it's been it's been overbought for about seventeen days. Obviously, not all seventeen days since markets are not open on the weekends. But we can see that we have had absolutely just gap up season we gapped up here gapped up here gapped up here gapped up here and this red one up here is actually the last gap that we have failed to close um north of this move right we haven't came back down to re retest anything yet and once again this was very similar to i'll show you in a second 
something that we saw back in 2021, but we were getting close to a death cross here, right? We were below the 200 EMA. Seemed like the, the 50 was going to start closing in very quickly. However, it just rallied once we started getting into the 200. Once we got above the 50, now we're seeing this good move to the upside here. But we created all these liquidity pockets down here, and we closed off about two or three of them to the upside that were significantly up higher, right? We closed one that was here. There was one over here that was needed to be closed. I think it was somewhere in this one right here. So we closed a good amount of them. And now we're right here today, closing the last one. Um, obviously, it can go up a little bit higher. 45, 67 is the end of it. So another 12 points up. Wouldn't be surprised if we get that before Wednesday. But, um, you know, a lot of people are expecting us to go to 4,800. A lot of people even saying 5,200. I think we need to be very cautious here because at the end of the day, there's two things I'm, I'm seeing. One, oh, three things actually. Liquidity all the way to the downside here in these blue boxes. I think that those will be filled. If the ones to the upside got filled, I anticipate that the ones to the downside will be filled, right? Uh, the other thing is that we're in a parallel channel. I mean, this is pretty clear parallel channel. We broke down out of here, but then we got the death cross rally, brought us back up into it. We're overbought on the daily, brought, overbought on the monthly, or just coming out of the overbought on the monthly. I think that'll change come uh, December, obviously, probably wick back up into it. But the key thing is the weekly. There is a little bit more room to the upside, which tells me that this week's probably going to remain green, right? I think that we're going to get nice and overbought to the weekly. We're going to see a lot of people that are buying in pretty late. We know that a lot of CTAs and a lot of people are doing stock buybacks right now. So this has definitely helped push the price up of the S&P. But the other things that I'm noticing are this trend line here from top. You know, we're finding... I think we'll find a little bit of a break above this white trend line, this big one right here, which would be into our supply zone or this uh, gap right here, which I would anticipate we get rejected, get some rejection at some point, just so that we could come back down and fill maybe one or two of these gaps before we start moving up or down in either direction. And the other thing is, if I look at this on, I think it's the daily. Yeah, I think it's the daily. So get rid of this white line here. And we'll take a look at a move very similar to this one here, which is right here, right? We were getting close to a death cross. And then next thing you know, we had a massive rally. We were getting close to a death cross. Then we had a massive rally. And then eventually the rally ended and it came down and we got the death cross. And then from that, we had a really good move to the downside. Uh, roughly, let's say 24%. I mean, we're putting in a lower, we're, as of right now, we're still lower highs, right? This is, I mean, we could even go all the way up to like 4,800 and still be putting in a lower high. It's not ideal because obviously we want to see this turn if we're bearish on the market. So we can continue that move to the downside. And all the technicals are saying that we need to have some type of uh, correction. Again, this has been an amazing year. Having, you know, that 12% drop here or 11% drop here to October and then having, how much have we pushed up this year so far in October? you know, roughly a 10.89% rally. It's, I mean, I, I think the markets are getting a bit greedy here if they're thinking all time highs or sustained push to the upside that we're in a bull market, right? If this was a bear market, this is probably one of the easiest bear markets that we've ever seen. It's just in my opinion, uh, for, for how much money we printed and how high the rates have been. Uh, that's just one of just my opinion, but I think that we are in, uh, still within it. And if we look at this, the Wall Street's, uh, what is it? Stock trading uh, cheat sheet. I mean, to me, this is max euphoria, and I think this is complacency. And you could even say that this is disbelief if you're using like subwaves within it. You can say that, yeah, this is 100% disbelief. People are, aren't expecting this market to go up. I think that if we look at this on the macro, though, we're looking at something much more sinister. And I think that right now, a lot of people are getting complacent in this market, and we need to be uh, very cautious here. And I think tech is driving a lot of it, right? Obviously, people are just extremely bullish on tech here. I don't Think they understand why i think a lot of the ai bubble also drove a lot of this earlier on in the year and the problem with ctas and these machines that are positioned why i have such an issue with them is that they're always chasing the market they're not necessarily you know early on a move if it gets above a certain level that just mass volume comes in and they just buy it up and then i think a lot of people get squeezed so they have to cover positions obviously that pushes the price up even further and then more people are just at the top just decide to fumble in right that's why we get these massive gaps because on the daily open in the futures market the price is just pushed up so significantly and you know we put in a new high yearly high for the nasdaq but we have some pretty good gaps to the downside and we've also broken out of this bullish flag right it's a bullish flag i don't uh I don't discount that one bit put in a move higher than the origin is it's getting close to a point where we're almost at the end yeah i mean the monthly is still over you know extremely overbought we're still putting in a lower high we could say that but the weekly again very similar to the s p it's a little bit more room to the upside on the weekly so i think we need to have another green week just finish it off we have four days of trading this week i don't think people are going to be doing much in terms of friday 
So just keep an eye on that. And then the Dow, very similar. It's just in a bull flag. I mean, it's in a bear flag. You know, it's going to probably find resistance on this red line here. We'll keep an eye on that. This is just my opinion. I, I can't say for sure because markets it can be irrational and mis- machines just have a lot more uh, liquidity than uh, people probably anticipate. A lot more than I anticipate, to be honest with you. But um, yeah, I mean, I think we'll find rejection from here. We might have to come down, fill some of these gaps, but we're still in this massive bear flag. Eventually, I do think that this is going to break and you know that would take us somewhere with 31K or 31,000 for the Dow. Um, could it go a lot lower? It depends. I mean, I think that there are some gaps down here that could be filled, but that's worst case scenario. For the time being, I do think that right now we're looking at potential uh, potential rejection off this move and then come down and maybe fill some of these gaps. Again, death cross rallies across the board, got the death cross, rallied into a golden cross. NASDAQ, uh, that death cross just doesn't want to come at all. But the S&P, I think, is a lot closer than people will probably anticipate. All right, my man. It's Yeah, it's a good week to just kind of... Not it's quiet week. week. You know, it's going to be a quiet week. We'll we'll be here uh, tomorrow and Wednesday to kind of keep you updated on what's happening. Wednesday, we'll talk about Tuesday's NVIDIA earnings, all of that good stuff. So it's a good week to do less. Try to try to plan out what you want to, to see happen or what you, you know, what your game plan is in the months ahead, right? Like quiet times like this, you don't need to be super active trading, but be, be thoughtful about, you know, how you're going to handle different scenarios. Like, question your beliefs question you know what your strategies are going to be in case things go a different way than you were anticipating yeah and the last thing i will touch on is that we've got that news over the weekend that the va is stopping foreclosures on veterans when it comes to mortgage forbearances we also know that the forbearance that was from covid is ending on the 30th of november so many people are going to have to resume paying their mortgages for um, any moratorium but the thing that's really interesting about the veterans one is that they're paying an extremely low rate. I think the average is like 3.5% or so. So if they're having issues defaulting there, imagine the civilians that have seven, you know, even higher. That's something we need to keep in mind. Plus, student loans are resuming right now. I think that the most important thing this week is probably the thing that's not going to get the most attention. That's probably going to be Black Friday sales over the weekend. Uh, if those numbers are terrible, you probably won't see them on the news anywhere. But I was so I saw an article about that actually before we started where like most people are, you know, from this survey, they surveyed a lot of people are still sticking with what they had budgeted for events like this. Now, there's also a lot of people who started taking advantage of sales like back in October. So that's going to be interesting. And then on the mortgage front, I want to say something in the area of like 30 to 40 percent of mortgage like homes these days don't even have a mortgage anymore because it's the same baby boomers who've been living there since the eighties and nineties when they were able to pay, you know, $75 and a, and a, a goat to get a, a house that would go for a million dollars <laughs> these days. So uh, it's, it's pretty weird out there, man. Like just no, you can't get into a home and you, like people just can't do it. It sucks. Like it really, really sucks. But yeah, the, we may see the mortgage defaults be a lot, less you know it's obviously gonna be less than it was during 08 because more people just have their homes paid off now uh and there aren't as many mortgages to default on and it's become a thing where like it's a luck unfortunately it's a luxury to own a home yeah i think more of the issues would probably come from rental properties if that were the case um and then airbnbs air airbnbs are looking bad yeah, the the fact that the CEO is just selling off mass amounts of shares, and then Jim Cramer's out here saying like it's it's foolish to sell off Airbnb. That's that's it's that's great. a great buy, a great company. All right, Jim, shut up. Yeah, uh, commercial real estate obviously too is really bad. With uh, I think some building in New York was seventy four percent loss that they sold it for. So I'm like, okay, uh, that, that's an issue too. Everyone's saying the regional banks are fine now; they're bouncing back. They're above the two hundred moving average. Uh, fuck, fuck if they will be forever. <laughs> we'll see about that. Exactly. All right. Appreciate everybody for watching. We'll be back tomorrow. Same time, same place. Hit that like button below. Subscribe to the channel. Drop a comment. Let us know how you're doing. Any questions you have. Have an awesome rest of your day. Stay safe in the markets. Enjoy the week, and we'll see you next time. Take care, everyone.